See, this is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. We are breaking with convention, war, peace, and the presidency. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from the Democratic National Convention here in Philadelphia, where former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has made history by becoming the first woman to accept a major party presidential nomination. I believe our economy isn't working the way it should because our democracy isn't working the way it should. That's why we need to appoint Supreme Court justices who will get money out of politics and expand voting rights, not restrict them. necessary, we will pass a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. I believe American corporations that have gotten so much from our country should be just as patriotic in return. Many of them are, but too many aren't. It's wrong to take tax breaks with one hand and give out pink slips with the other. And I believe Wall Street can never, ever be allowed to wreck Main Street again. And I believe in science. <laughs> I believe climate change is real and that we can save our planet while creating millions of good paying clean energy jobs. I believe that when we have millions of hard working immigrants contribute to our economy, it would be self-defeating and inhumane to try to kick them out. Comprehensive immigration reform will grow our economy and keep families together, and it's the right thing to do. So, whatever party you belong to or if you belong to no party at all. If you share these beliefs, this is your campaign. To talk more about the historic nomination of Hillary Clinton, we're joined now by two guests. Rebecca Traster is writer at large for New York Magazine, who's written about Hillary Clinton for a decade. Her most recent article headlined, Hillary is poised to make the impossible possible for herself and for women in America. She's the author of All the Single Ladies, Unmarried Women, and the Rise of an Independent Nation. We're also joined by Kshama Sawant, a Socialist City Council member of Seattle. She helped win a $15 an hour minimum wage for all workers in Seattle. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Rebecca, let's begin with you. You were on the floor of the convention last night when Hillary Clinton gave that speech. Your reaction? Well, I was listening. From the floor, it was hard to tell how it was going over. I mean, there was because there were protesters. Um, I had I could hear the protesters. I was watching what was happening. I was paying attention. I wasn't I wasn't as focused on the speech and how it was being received. I was very aware of the the sort of theatrical tensions within the room. Everybody trying to drown each other out, and so. And as somebody who's written about Hillary Clinton for a very long time and knows that these moments, these big speech moments, where she's supposed to give some kind of speech that inspires and unites um, don't always go very well for her. This is not this is not her forte as a politician. Um, uh, you know, I, I wasn't quite sure. I, overnight, I've read some of the reactions, and it seems to me that it has been much better received than many speeches that Hillary gives. I, in part, I think it had a lot of the marks of Bernie Sanders on it. I mean, I, one of the things that surprised me as I was listening to it, um, is the time that she spent talking about Bernie um, and his supporters in warm ways, I'm sure ways that were not necessarily persuasive to those <laughs> those who were objecting, um, and that you heard so much about, I mean, you heard 
you saw in that speech the product of what this primary process has done with regard to Hillary's candidacy. Walking into this election cycle, as somebody who's written about Hillary, has had a lot of ambivalence about her tendencies to move toward the center. You know, a year and a half ago, I could have imagined a very different convention speech in which Hillary Clinton gets the nomination. And I, um, I think that the role that the Bernie left has played, not just Bernie Sanders himself, but his supporters, but you know the fact that there were protesters in there, um, has moved Hillary Clinton in ways that, as somebody who has always been to the left of her ideologically, I'm very grateful for. And I think that you did see the marks of that in that speech. And we have a different candidate for president than we would have had we not had this primary process. Shama Sawant, the message throughout this week in your response to Hillary Clinton, the first woman to be nominated by a major party to be president of the United States. Well, as a socialist and a feminist myself, and as a woman and a woman of color, I have no question in my mind that in order to make social change, it is absolutely critical that women, people of color, all the members of the oppressed communities under capitalism be on the forefront of struggle. But I think the identity of the person we are talking about, the leading people, uh, is, are, are much less important. Their identity, identities are much less important. What's far more critical is where they stand. So if you look at the significance of her being the first female nominee, I understand the appeal of that. I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. But here's what I would say. I actually, you know, I'm, I, all throughout this campaign uh, season, I was reminded of a show, uh, uh, an episode that you played, Amy, in 2008, when you had Melissa Harris Perry and Gloria Steinem debating. And Gloria was saying, well, if you're a woman, you need to vote for Clinton, Hillary Clinton. And Melissa was saying, well, if you're a person of color, you need to vote for Obama. And I was sitting there watching as a woman of color saying, neither of these candidates represent my interests as a woman of color. And the reason I say that is, is, is has less to do with their identity and far more to do with the interests they represent. At the end of the day, we don't, I don't think the debate is about her speech skills and all of that. It's more uh, the fact that she is a dogged representative of Wall Street and Wall Street interests, and her entire party, the Democratic Party and the establishment that controls it, is a representative of Wall Street interests. And yes, there are differences between Republicans and Democrats, but that is one thing they agree on, that they are primar primarily advocates for Wall Street. And Hillary Clinton is well on her way to be the international emissary for the fracking industry, which is so dangerous, so much so that she has refused to really uh, you know, uh, even accept that th this is going to be a huge problem in terms of climate change. But you look at the whole spectrum of issues. A lot of people think that, well, it's a woman leader and this is going to be important. But look, she was on the board of Walmart for six years. Walmart is the world's biggest purveyor of poverty wages. And who do you think it affects? It affects women at the very bottom. You heard from the woman, the po poignant story of the woman, I saw her last night at the protest, who said that because welfare was destroyed under Bill Clinton, she, her mother be, had to become a sex worker. Hillary Clinton was not an innocent bystander when welfare was dismantled. She actually paid, played an active political role alongside Bill Clinton and the New Democrats. Now, as a feminist, I would have loved for her to have, have played an active role to shore up welfare, to make sure that women's living standards could have been improved. It, uh, unfortunately for us, she's playing a very active role as a woman, but as a defender of Wall Street. So we really need to get outside of that. And if people are looking for a woman to support, think about Jill Stein. Rebecca Traister. Well, there are a lot of parts of what you just said. I'm, I'm in agreement with you about, about parts of it. I'm very, I am also interested in, in getting money out of politics. I don't think that's the only issue that's at stake here. I think that there's a degree to which and as somebody who has written about my ambivalence and criticism of Hillary Clinton on some of these counts, um, I think that I, I'm glad that you and, and her other critics are making these points very, very loudly. I don't think those are the only issues at stake, though. I don't think that her, what you see as her role as an emissary of Wall Street is where these questions end, and that voting for Jill Stein is a solution that works either in terms of feminism or in terms of addressing the issues that you care so passionately about. You, Jill Stein is not going to win the presidency. And the person who would win the presidency if Hillary Clinton is stopped, and I understand the impulse to stop her, is Donald Trump. And so when it comes to issues of fracking, of Wall Street, 
of paid leave, of subsidized childcare, of protecting what social programs we have in place now and shoring up social programs in the future and not seeing them destroyed in terms of immigration reform. I think there are all those issues on the table. I am not sure that the feminist choice is supporting a woman who, has, who offers very little threat of actually winning. Um, I would also say with regard to welfare reform, which uh, is policy that I abhor and loathe and was critical of and horrified by at the time, uh, I think it's extremely fair to criticize Hillary, the public statements that Hillary Clinton made in support of it, but I also think it's really important to contextualize what her actual role in it was. She was not in elected office, and I'm not excusing her. She made statements in support of it. However, you have to understand and consider the fact that she was under enormous pressure as the wife. She wasn't in elected office. She was playing the wife. She was a controversial wife. She was widely seen, incorrectly, as a radical left force within that White House in that era, and there was tremendous pressure on her to be supporting her husband, which ties into all kinds of old you know, assumptions about wifeliness and the role that first ladies are supposed to play. Um, yes, it is absolutely fair to, to criticize the statement she made in support of welfare reform, to look critically at what role she played. There are all kinds of different stories about how she was trying to exert influence over that legislation as it was happening. But I don't think that asking Hillary Clinton to pay the bill for welfare reform and for the crime bill in a way that the members, including Joe Biden, including John Kerry, who was a nominee, uh, the idea that this bill is being handed to Hillary Clinton, who was not in elected office but was in this ceremonial position during those years, is the way to productively, critically address the ravages of welfare reform. Sham Sawant. Well, I don't agree that she was in any ceremonial position. She was playing an active political role. But we don't need to quibble over those details. Hillary Clinton has been long enough in politics that she has her own independent track record as Secretary of State, as a warmonger, and as a lobbyist in chief for big business and for multi-billionaire interests. I don't see how we can, in any honesty, expect a woman who takes uh, you know, a quarter of a million dollars for every speech that she makes to Goldman Sachs, you know, who has been uh, a, a rapacious factor in the global economic crisis as somebody who will represent the interests of ordinary people. But I think, you know, again, we need to move away from an individualized and personalized narrative of politics to the larger context in which all of this is happening. The real problem here is not just her but the fact that the Democratic Party and the establishment that controls it has a long track record of a systematic betrayal of the interests of working people and, you know, not to mention uh, war abroad. So I think that when people are worried about Trump, it's absolutely legitimate. I am abs horrified. I find Trump's agenda of misogyny, bigotry, hatred, and anti-immigrant hysteria absolutely stomach-turning. But if we are to actually defeat the phenomenon of Trump, then we have to look at Trump, the, the Trump phenomenon, not as something that happened just out of nowhere, out of thin air, but understand that the Trump phenomenon is a product of the fact that both the establishment parties, Republicans and Democrats, have moved to the right over the last several decades. Simi and similarly, when the Tea Party and the Republican right made gains in 2010, that was not because America suddenly woke up and went right wing. That was because millions of people were dejected and angry at Obama's corporate bailouts, and they were so disappointed and betrayed. And what's striking about that election is that it had the historically the lowest voter turnout since the Second World War. What does this tell us? This tells us that there's a huge chasm between the, where the establishment stands and the establishment parties and ordinary Americans. And the reason Trump finds an echo is not because millions of people are racist. It's because millions of people are looking for an alternative. They're grasping for an alternative to corporate politics. So the question really is this. How can, if we want to defeat Trump, then the bigger question is how would we defeat Trump and avoid building an ongoing basis for the right wing. And the reason the right wing finds an echo is because the left has failed to build so far. And this year, if we don't talk about concrete left politics through the Jill Stein campaign, then we are going to leave the field open for Trump. Trump is, and Trump and the libertarian candidate Gary Johnson are going to have monopoly over millions of disenchanted voters. Rebecca Treister. Well, I wanna, I'm curious about this. So do you think that 
encouraging people to vote for for Jill Stein is going to defeat Trump. I mean, what do you what do you actually envision happening if you're if the idea is more of us should be voting for Jill Stein because we're dissatisfied well, with Hillary Clinton? First of all, it's a problem to look at presidential election years as something that's in a you know it's in its own box and then everything else is disconnected. That's not how it works. And in reality, everything in history points towards the fact that building mass movements on the ground are absolutely critical in order to make social change. And those mass movements actually die a sorry death as long as we don't build independent of those mass movements. The reason we succeeded in winning $15 an hour, because I and Socialist Alternative ran our campaign in defiance of the Democratic Party establishment in Seattle, and we fought for 15. Do you think the Democrats led on it or even supported it? No, they were dragged along and were forced to vote on it because the vast majority of people in Seattle Seattle built our movement on the streets and forced them for it. And that's the example of what we're talking about. And what's at stake is not whether Jill Stein is going to win or not. The fact is this. If on November 6th we have a very strong vote, million and a half, two million, three million votes for Jill Stein, that will make this movement that we're building sit up, ordinary people sit up, the people who are going to make change, sit up and take notice that it is possible to build an independent party of the 99 percent, which is the real goal we need to go towards. Well, first of all, I want to say I agree with you completely about your point about presidential politics being in this box, and this is the only time we come and focus on it. It's a real mistake. It's it's uh, absolutely detrimental to the way that, that the system works and that this is the only time we can get people to tune in and feel strongly about it. I, that is, in fact, precisely why I, who, who agreed with his politics very strongly, had doubts about Bernie Sanders from a, from a practical perspective be, as the nominee, because I worried that putting somebody, the, because I, uh, I agree that individual ascension to, to the top or leadership positions within parties that have not shifted all the way down the ranks. Uh, gave me tremendous anxiety that it would hurt a movement to the left to put to put a left candidate at the top with a recalcitrant Congress, a recalcitrant state and local governments, and that, in fact, the move to the left had to be from the bottom up. So I, I just want to say that I absolutely agree with you. However, what we are now heading into, and, and this is why I wanted to understand, are you envisioning the push for Stein as being big enough that it that it gets people to pay attention, but not big enough that it damages Hillary Clinton's prospects. Because I, while I agree with you that this shouldn't just be about individual stories, and it's not just about Hillary Clinton, it's part of larger systems. The reality is, in November, there is going to be an election, and one person's going to win it. And even if we understand that this is about larger systems, that one person is going to gain a certain amount of control over systems, including the Supreme Court that's going to make decisions over the course, you know, that are going to affect a generation or two. And so I think there's, uh, while I agree with you wholeheartedly that we should be looking at this more holistically and systemically and talking about how the Fight for 15 and the activist work on the ground that is being done around paid leave, paid sick days, um, these things that none of the presidential candidates have really been on the ground with, none of them, including Hillary Clinton, including Bernie Sanders, you know, obviously not Donald Trump or the Republicans, we absolutely need to move the, those activists into, into politics and up the pipeline. But we also can't fool ourselves that the individual questions of who's going to win the presidency in November are meaningless. They're going to carry meaning and weight and, and realities for, for millions of Americans. But so those of us who are talking about building an independent party for the 99 percent, we take the question of the presidential elections absolutely seriously. I, I, don't, I am not saying that it is meaningless. But here, here's the question I would like to ask. If the Democratic Party establishment, the Democratic National Committee, was uh, it had at its first priority to defeat Trump, I have no doubt that they want to defeat Trump. But if that was their topmost priority, then why did they not do everything in their power to pr promote the one candidate who, through many, many polls, was indicated to have been real, a really prominent, uh, a, a very powerful voice against Trump and having the real possibility of winning against Trump? And I, obviously, I'm talking about Bernie Sanders. Instead, what the Democratic National Committee has done is use every dirty trick in the book to stymie his campaign. And the reason Bernie did not succeed the Democratic, in winning the Democratic nomination is not because the Democratic base didn't support him. I mean, he has electrified an entire 
entire base of tens of millions of people. The reason he didn't win the nomination is not because of recalcitrant Congress, it's because of a recalcitrant Democratic Party establishment for whom, although defeating Trump is the priority, a bigger priority for the Democratic Party establishment is to defeat the agenda of working people to really fight for the massive social change because uh, the interests of ordinary working people uh, and the interests of Wall Street are diametrically opposite. The interests of Wall Street are completely antagonistic to the interests of ordinary working people. So as long as we tie ourselves, forget about individuals, as long as we tie ourselves to a party that is tied to Wall Street, that our movements will reach a graveyard in the Democratic Party. Let's break, and then we're going to come back to this discussion. And thank you very much, because I warned you before the show, no sound bites. And <laughs> you've taken me at my word. I want to thank um, Kashama Saman, she'll be back in one minute, who is a socialist city council member in Seattle. She spearheaded the movement for $15 an hour, um, and they won. Rebecca Traster is with us. She's a writer at large for New York Magazine, just wrote somehow between yesterday and today a major piece on the significance of Hillary Clinton as the first woman um, to be nominated by a major party for president of the United States. Stay with